have received the Medal of Honor. And the defendant will be God himself. He was never a businessman. You're either on the menu or around the table. Islamic banking. It's the best feeling in the world. It's a fundamentally different lifestyle. That's not a good look for you already. Two tours in Afghanistan with the highest rate of alcohol consumption per capita. If you enjoy what you do, you know, you'll never work a day in your life. Today we have a special guest, he's Jewish and he has escape room and he told me what is he doing, how tricky is it and how expensive is it to create a business in the United States. Let's go a little bit faster. I was born in Moldavia, it's the poorest country in Europe, with the highest rate of alcohol consumption per capita. When I was 17 I came here to America, to Brooklyn, and that's where I've lived ever since. And I'm 42. I went to college, I have a degree in statistics. I have a family, I have five kids. Yeah, this is my first time starting a business. We'll see what happens. Where did you work before? So before I started this business, I worked for a number of uh, marketing uh, analytics, kind of statistical modeling uh, types of jobs. It's also called data science uh, today. And uh, I've done that for 14 years. And uh, with this with this project, I decided to try something uh, something new and uh, something that's not uh, closely connected with data science. It's a little pivot, a little change. Why escape room? Escape room is a very unique uh, way to uh, communicate uh, very difficult concepts. I see it as a, as an educational vehicle, as a way to uh, explain something uh, very technical to people that normally would resist uh, learning about this topic. And that's the only work that I have now. Thank God I have my uh, my wife who has a job, so we we've been surviving. I would like to do it. How much money I have to pay? For, you have to for... pay thirty dollars a person. Вчера вечером мы думали, что делать, и мы пошли посидеть в кафе. И сидел парень, и мы с ним поговорили, и узнали, что он работает в компании, которая работает на Wall Street, и они занимаются долгами. Нью-Йорк, Некротерия. И мы познакомились с Рубаном. И он расскажет свою историю, как давно он живет в Америке и чем он занимается. Bye. People come to me on a day-to-day -day basis. that they need on their day-to-day -day life. They are sinking in debt. They have tried all of the options. The last thing that they're looking at is bankruptcy. That is something that I only entertain at the end when I see that all other options are exhausted. I put them in a position where it's a plan for them, where they're gonna understand exactly what steps are gonna be taken, what procedures they're gonna go through, what processes are set in place for them to successfully get out of debt. I had a man that has been to two tours in Afghanistan and he's been fighting for this country for half of his life you could say. He had received the Medal of Honor, he was a highly decorated sniper. When he came back, he came back with PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so he was in a position where uh, he was not able to sleep at night and he was not able to get a stable job when he came back and so this had put him in a situation where he had to rely on a credit card. So the debt accumulated, it was to a point where he had almost $35,000 of debt. This uh, disability check, the payment that he was receiving from the government just wasn't covering his month-to-month -month basis. He reached out to me, we had a very a conversation in length 
and he was actually writing a book about his entire journey and what brought up what brought him up to that and we discussed the entire book and the bond that I created with him was that it came the conclusion was that I have to be in this book also because I'm a part of his story. So we were able to put him in a plan where he was gonna get out of that that in approximately uh, four years. A lot of people are ashamed that they have so much debt and so it's not easy for them just to call and talk to anybody. He's hanging in there. He's, he's definitely a tough guy. I mean, two tours in Afghanistan, it's no joke. He's American? Yes, he is American. If you enjoy what you do, you know, you'll never work a day in your life. That's true. I agree with you. What you guys are doing right now is absolutely great. We, we love what we do. Can I tell you a funny story about being Jewish in Frankfurt? Yeah, of course. When I was a student and I went to, uh, to a good school, it's called, uh, it's called Columbia, I had a job in Germany, in Frankfurt. And at that time, I started becoming more observant. I started wearing a yarmulke when I was working for Commerzbank uh, in Frankfurt. They have a tall tower. Yeah, we know. And, uh, and I was working in their uh, marketing department for the summer. And at, at one point, the director of marketing uh, came, uh, came to me and asked me, Gennady, do you ever take off that uh, skull cap? A yarmulke. Keeper. So I said I prefer not to even though I just started wearing it like a couple of months before that He said okay fine uh, And later I discovered that uh, there was a group of um, Arab Arab business people businessmen yeah. uh, from Saudi Arabia that were visiting Commerzbank yeah. and they wanted to off open what's called Islamic banking a kind, kind of, of product yeah. and they wanted me to be a part of the meeting but they were scared that uh, the Arabs will get upset to see uh, an Orthodox Jew in the room so they just didn't invite me. They wanted me to take off the yarmulke so that I don't appear uh, visibly Jewish and I said that I'm not comfortable they said okay and they just didn't invite me but that was uh, a very interesting experience in Frankfurt. What is your feeling about this? I think it's a very European thing. No conflict. We can agree with everyone we don't have to take uh, strong uh, moral kind of positions. I think today in Europe it's not so safe to wear yarmulke. Since I started uh, becoming more observant, I haven't gone to Europe in probably at least a decade. Partly because of this, partly because I don't, I don't feel safe. Even though a lot of people say that it's really in our head. One time I forgot to, to bring down the gates for the store and I left it for, when I left for Shabbos. Yeah. I went home Friday, Friday afternoon and when I came back to work on, uh, on Sunday, Sunday is a work day, first day of the week, somebody came came up to me and said, we saw your store open on Shabbos. Do you open on Shabbos? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh no, we just forgot to uh, to bring down the uh, the gates. We are really closed. But somebody asked me. What is the biggest problem in your business? The biggest problem is uh, the business focuses on a pretty small demographic. There are a lot of people in this in this demographic, but it's pretty limited in terms of geography and also in terms of their lifestyle. The vast majority of my customers are Orthodox Jews. The families are very large, mm -hmm. which is good for business, but at the same time, when they go out for family activities yeah. at very specific times, and also everybody at the same time. There is no culture of like, going out nightly mm -hmm. or weekly to uh, for an activity yeah. at, at least that I've uh, that I've experienced for my for my my business and uh, it means they coming but not so often no they're coming uh, at, at certain times let's say on, on Jewish holidays when they're off from school mm -hmm. and they're coming in huge numbers mm -hmm. in such numbers that I can't even handle and they're not coming at all at other times I've experienced a very interesting problem with non-jews for some reason that they that this business is not for them it's not true I'm actually actively trying to reach them and welcome them I even put at the front that the uh, Jews and non-Jews are welcome, are very welcome. And, uh, and, uh, and it's not uh, resonating still, so that's one of my challenges that I have to overcome. NYC Rush, Atlantic Avenue, all the trains connect over here. So if you want to go to uptown, downtown, up, down, all around, doesn't matter, you go this way.
Какое твое самое любимое место в Нью-Йорке? Манхэттен. Манхэттен? Манхэттен, да, ночью. Почему? The night life. It's the city that never sleeps. Когда езжаешь в Манхэттен ночью, там, с друзьями. Все есть в Манхэттене. Все, что хочешь, ты всегда найдешь в Нью-Йорке. How many hours do you work? I work a minimum of 40 hours every week. Sometimes it depends, you know, uh, you know, you can't really put a time limit as to what somebody needs and, you know, especially when somebody's in dire need of your help, you want to make sure you attend to them also. So there's times where I stay a little longer than I than I have to. I love doing what I do and it never feels like it's work to me. And so as long as I'm uh, helping somebody, at the end of the day, you know, I did my job as a human being. And I recommend that to everybody that's out there. If there's one thing that you can do to help somebody on a day-to-day -day basis, it's the best feeling in the world. You told us you were studying in Colum Colombia, right? Correct. Yeah, it's one of the uh, one of the best schools in uh, in the world. How yeah. was it? Uh, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. I'm uh, I'm happy with uh, the years that I spent there. I never lived on campus. Mm -hmm. I always lived at home in Brooklyn, and I took the uh, train, train, which can take up to an hour and a half to get there from uh, where I lived. But it was still a very stimulating experience. When I think back to, to those times, they were very happy times. It was a challenging school. It was uh, difficult to, uh, to do well. It was a good experience. How many years did you study? I studied there for four years. You made your bachelor? Bachelor's degree. Okay. I'm actually only now in, uh, in graduate school to, to for, uh, for my second degree, mm -hmm. but uh, in an online program. Also a good school, mm -hmm. you may have heard it's called Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's for? It's in Baltimore. It's also one of the best schools in the world, so I'm doing a master's in uh, data science, which is kind of applied statistics that I'm taking remotely these days because I have a family, I work full time, that's the way I study these days. How expensive is it to study in United States or in Colorado? When I studied, it was uh, much cheaper than it is now. Modern day student at Columbia, if they live on campus in the dorm and they eat there, they can easily spend 70,000 a year. 70, wow. Seven zero. M multiply five, right? It's a lot of money. Wow. When I went, it was much cheaper. It was closer to maybe 25,000 a year. That's how, it, how much more expensive it became. How can people afford it? The government uh, lets, lets them borrow mm -hmm. all this money that they will be repaying for the rest of their life. You became religious when you was 25? No, younger. Younger? I was about 19, 20. Why? It, it means your parents are not religious. My parents are not religious. I met my wife in Israel, lived in Israel for a little bit after the wedding. And came back. And came here. When I announced to my to my mother that I would like to stay in Israel, she uh, she made a very big scandal, <laughs> and uh, and she actually had to be treated for depression. Yeah. She became depressed. I decided that I'm not gonna kill my mother because of the mitzvah of living in Israel. My wife's parents now live here also, they're from Belarus. I felt that we grew up without uh, any particular tradition. At some point, I've realized that it's something that I definitely want mm -hmm. in, uh, in my life, to have uh, a strong tradition. And then I started getting learning about uh, my uh, Jewish heritage, learning about Jewish religion, Jewish texts, and I found this world to be uh, so attractive that I, uh, that I never left. <laughs> I came in and I never left. 
what is different to be religious or to not to be religious it's about it's it's about everything okay it's about how you spend money it's about how you educate children it's about where they go to school where you live where you go on vacation what you eat the difference is dramatic it's a fundamentally different lifestyle from what people around us are leading most of my income is uh, spent on, on Jewish education you are working also from home or you are working only no, from home? No, I, I work from my office. I have everything here. Uh, I have the ability to work from home, but I, I like the work environment. I like the, the staff, the energy that's in the work uh, atmosphere. Not far from Bull. Not far from my Bull. about what you do you know a lot of people wake up every day they go to work they don't even know why they're going to work right it's just they're living paycheck to paycheck and at the end of the day you know five ten years pass and you're still doing the same job it doesn't get you anywhere and so number one is definitely passion uh, to do what you actually want to do because that's the only way that you'll get ahead because you're gonna pursue that no matter what happens whether you fail you succeed doesn't matter it's what you want to do eventually it's gonna pick up and so you definitely have to have the determination, you have to have the hunger. Especially in Manhattan, this is the land of the sharks. You, you're either on the menu or around the table. It's your choice. I love it. So you have to, you have to decide what you want. Again, the opportunities are out there, you have to, you have to take it in a way. No, but nothing will ever be given to you here. So you have to go out there and you gotta take what's yours. Because if you don't, what's gonna happen to you is that you're gonna end up working the rest of your life making somebody else's dream come true. We're all human, everybody makes mistakes. I agree. Things happen uh, sometimes out of your control. And so you wanna make sure that you do your end. You wanna make sure that everything is done from your end to uh, not have anybody gain any kind of points on you, meaning to have a, a fishka, right? Yeah. To use against you whenever you know they decide to because you made one too many mistakes. I live not far, and this is the closest uh, Jewish neighborhood. It's a famous story with the uh, Shpola Zayda, who is also a, an important character in, uh, in our story, in the story of the escape room. At one point, there was a famine in Russia. He had a very unusual solution to this hunger. He gathered his colleagues, his friends, that were also righteous Torah scholars, saints like him. He announced that he is calling a court case and the defendant uh, in this court case will be God himself. And they argued in this court when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai, gave them certain obligations and uh, and in exchange he took upon himself also obligation. For instance, when a husband marries a wife, she has obligations towards him and he has obligations towards her. So they argued that while the Jewish people is fulfilling their obligation, towards God, which is a very a uniquely Hasidic approach to not see any faults with the, with the Jewish people, love of the Jewish people to an illogical uh, extent. And they said that the Jewish people are fully fulfilling their obligations towards God. God, on the other hand, is not fulfilling his obligations towards the Jewish people. And uh, he has to feed them, he has to protect them, and he's not fulfilling those obligations. So they found God guilty. And, uh, and they announced that he is obligated within 30 days to correct his conduct and uh, deliver food for, for the Jewish community and that's, and that's exactly what happened. The famine at that point stopped. That's a famous story and this is the uh, painting. How big is it? 2,000 uh, square foot space. It's for us more or less 200 quadrat meters. It used to be a supermarket. So we have uh, two escape rooms, each consists of two separate rooms mm -hmm. and also have an, a, an art gallery. So in this room, uh, where we are now, we're trying to recreate an Ellis Island records office. Ellis Island is the, uh, is the place where immigrants came on their way to America. A family tree that's missing parts. So the guests uh, have to find the missing parts by working with different documents, <coughs> different artifacts, different photographs and inscriptions. That's the timing? Yeah. Our second experience uh, 
which is going to be in this room. Mm -hmm. Is it true that the first escape rooms was in Japan? It started in, in Japan and Asia and then spread throughout Asia to uh, China, Korea. In Beijing alone they had more than 80. Then it went for some reason to Europe into Hungary. And what do you think? Somebody have to study today to get a good position or you can do it even without so university at the all? The school system itself, uh, it wasn't for me. I wasn't able to go through entire eight years of school. I was going for dentistry, but I realized it's not what uh, my passion is, what my calling is. My father's a dentist, but again, in this country, you have many opportunities to do things outside of school. There's courses you could take, six week courses, eight week courses, you know, to specialize in something specific not to have a general idea in school but to learn something specific like real estate for example you could go to a 72 hour class you could go take your state exam and you can have a real estate license uh, you know entrepreneurs none of them really uh, you know they don't put too much time in school they just work on their mastering their craft what they're really good at but if you want to work in a, in a huge company is they looking at your degree is it like yes. most important yes. things that if it's gonna be between somebody who has a, a master's degree and somebody who the two, two same exact people they have the same values everything is great about them but this one doesn't have a master's this one does most likely they're gonna go with this of course he, because that dedicated. shows from his end, it shows dedication, it shows, it shows determination because it's not the easiest thing to get that master's degree. <laughs> it was a pleasure speaking to you guys. I'm actually late to work. Okay, I'll man. see you, you alright? Let's go guys. Всегда, когда мы подходим с камерой, или людям не важно, и им интересно попасть в камеру, им или им просто все равно, или в других странах, в основном в Европе, говорят, не снимайте меня, уйдите. А, хотя у нас был один случай, мы sorry, подошла женщина и сказала, я вам сейчас выбью камеру, идите в жопу, да? Вообще в Манхэттене люди готовы сниматься, люди этим живут, и когда мы идем с камерой, мы самые обычные. Или мы идем с камерой, или мы идем с мороженым, это никого не волнует. I post daily. Facebook and Instagram. We have a website that we keep adding content. The artist that was, that's, uh, that Hello. made all the beautiful art. This is for you. I just thank you that I have the opportunity to make an exhibition here. Thank you so much. Very special. Thank you. very special person in my life. This is uh, Magida Shoshana Brambacher. I reached out to her. I wanted to uh, create a special space for meditation. I knew that Shoshana has a whole series of artworks. And then I got an email from Mr. Biederman who said I have here this first Jewish escape room. So Mr. Biederman said would you like to embellish our wall? It is the first stationary Jewish escape room in the Western Hemisphere. We had a group here. They are not married. They're in their 40s. Four people. They came from California. They were doing four different escape rooms on that day. They're crazy. They go all over the world and do escape rooms. And so they came here and they solved it simply because they solve escape rooms all the time. something what I never seen before the stories of the pictures Amlie the owner he was never a businessman and he sold and told I'm I'm happy that my wife helping me that my wife working I think this is also a very good point to have a special relationship at home and to support each other у нас сегодня будет тоже очень очень интересная встреча с политиком из Узбекистана и он вам расскажет свою историю он живет и в Узбекистане, и в Америке. Он еще работает на радио. Я думаю, что он вам понравится. Интересный был такой опыт. 
мы подошли к полицейскому и спросили, можно ли поснимать про них. И никто не был против, я на самом деле не ожидал, что даже, даже органы тут открытые.